Good morning. The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us worship God together. Two sons, two responses, two very different journeys. A common motive and theme in our scriptures. Think of Cain and Abel, Ham and Sham, Abraham and Nahor, Manasseh and Ephraim, Paris and Zerah, Eleazar and Gershom, Moab and Ammon, Ishmael and Isaac, Jacob and Esau. Reuben and Judah. But today's parable is not the one of the prodigal son. It is another, less familiar one, that Jesus tells to honor an honest no. It is provocative and unsettling, bold and radical in its wisdom. I'm reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 28 to 31. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus' parable is informed by a very realistic view of human behavior. He does not shy away from saying it as it is. And he's speaking to those who see themselves as examples and role models, the religious elite. He forces them to face a very bitter reality. Good intentions alone are not good enough. What matters are not proclamations, promises or confessions. What matters are actions. For if deeds do not follow words, then those words mean nothing. We need to be willing and committed to take responsibility and act upon our deepest convictions. But do we need to be reminded of this? And is Jesus not being too harsh? 
Can you just go ahead and divide humanity into two camps, those who act and those who do not act? Are good intentions as such not also already something beautiful? One could argue that at least the heart is in the right place. And are there not sometimes very good reasons why we cannot quite follow up on our good intentions? Our text does not tell us why the second son does not keep his promises. He is not given the chance to explain himself. Now let us have a closer look at this exchange between a father and his two sons. The father goes to the first son and asks him to go and work today in the vineyard. The first son's response is very telling. He does not just say no to the father. He rather says, I will not. He makes it very clear that he does not want to go there today. And he does so without offering an apology or making an excuse. His response is clear, bold and honest. Given the patriarchal setting of the story, the son's refusal to follow the father's instruction is nothing short of an open rebellion. But the story does not end there. For just as honest and transparent as the son's refusal is, is also his repentance. Our text says, but later he changed his mind and went. The Greek idiom used for this remorse highlights the emotional side of the son's turning and presents it to us as a real change of heart. The first son deeply regretted his initial refusal and then went to work in the vineyard. What about the second son? Once again, we have to look very carefully at the actual wording and expression in Jesus' narration. It is important to notice that the second son's words and actions do not simply mirror the ones of his brother. For when the father speaks to the second son and sends him to work in the vineyard, the second son immediately agrees. But he does not simply mirror the first son's response by saying, I will. The Greek idiom presents us rather with a very succinct response. Yes, sir. What is going on? First of all, the second son addresses his father with sir, the way a slave addresses his master. And the reply is a brief and a staccato one, like the reply of a soldier that would be to expect it to respond to his superior. In other words, the second son's reply is submissive and almost fearful. To capture the mood and sentiment of this response, one would have to translate it with, I, I, sir. But then he does not go to work in the vineyard. There are no explanations made and we wonder what happened to him. We can only speculate why he chose not to go. Did he just pretend to avoid any further discussion? Did he become resentful about not really having a choice? Was his yes driven more by fear than conviction? Was he not bold and honest enough to say no? Was he hoping to avoid confrontation? What we know is that only the one who had the courage to say no 
began to feel remorse and in the end went to work in the vineyard. With this parable, Jesus is not just warning us to walk the talk. Does he not first of all encourage us to be more honest with ourselves and to be bold and to state what we really think and feel? It seems that Jesus trusts those more who initially resist his call to follow him. Is he worried that those who too quickly agree with him do not really know what they are getting into? He must realize that some of his demands are so outrageous and radical that only an initial bold no would be an honest and appropriate response. Does Jesus believe that open rebellion against God holds a greater promise than fearful submission? Think of Abraham outside the gates of Sodom and Gomorrah. He said no to God's decision to destroy the cities. He stood up to God and boldly negotiated with God, insisting on what he himself believed to be just and fair. Think of the book of Job and Job's initial response to his suffering. He cursed the day of his birth and rebuked his friends who all try to defend God's actions. In the end it is Job and not his theologian friends who is called righteous. Think of the prophet Jonah and his attempt to flee from God and to resist his calling to preach to his enemies, the citizens of Nineveh. In the end, his message to Nineveh would cause an enormous repentance Fasting and mourning included the cattle in the fields. Think of the prodigal son who decided to leave his father's vineyards and go his own way. In the end, it is he and not the brother who remained at home who would fully receive and understand the gift of his father's unconditional love. Sometimes an honest no carries a much greater promise than a quick and glib yes. Maybe we are sometimes missing out by also being too quick to agree and submit to Jesus' radical call of discipleship. We run the risk of becoming fearful hypocrites and miss out on the opportunity of genuine remorse. An honest no can find very different expressions. Sometimes we need to first take leave before we return and are able to embrace our calling. Bartolomeo Morillo, one of the most celebrated painters of the Spanish Golden Age, captured the moment of the prodigal son's departure. Two sons. Two responses, two very different journeys. Without this painful but honest departure, the son would not be able to understand and experience the depth of his parents' love. It will empower him to return and to work in God's vineyards. Thank you.
So what is the punchline of the parable? That words as such don't really matter if they are not followed up by concrete actions? But do we need a parable to tell us that? Is this not common knowledge and a given? We have to give Jesus credit to be more witty and provocative than repeating the obvious. The Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard picked this up when he tried to interpret this parable. Kierkegaard himself was known for his biting criticism of a Christianity that had made peace with its own mediocrity. He first of all offers a new angle by suggesting a contrast not just between words and actions, but also between thinking and doing. He might be speaking to his fellow philosophers and theologians when he reminds them, the highest of all is not to understand the highest, but to act upon it. Kierkegaard takes a side swipe at those that intellectualize Christianity and content themselves with pondering scriptures and, and having beautiful thoughts without ever feeling the need to act upon them. There's always the temptation of living in an ivory tower. But Kierkegaard goes further than that when he suggests that the actual punchline of Jesus' parable is even more provocative and outrageous. He begins with a warning that refers to the second son. Beware, the yes of promise keeping is sleep inducing. Kierkegaard highlights the danger of always playing it safe, which can indeed be sleep inducing. We hear Jesus speak to us and simply nod our head in pious assent. As if faith is only about agreeing with Jesus and believing what Jesus believes, actions become secondary and are delayed indefinitely without any risk to one's good standing and reputation. And so whenever Jesus is caught up in a controversy, we tend to side and identify with Jesus instead of seeing ourselves in his opponents. We are quick to align ourselves with what Kierkegaard calls the yes of promise keeping. But we run the risk of keeping the radical nature of his teachings in calling at arm's length. The theologian, pastor and martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer shared a similar concern when he warned his fellow theologians of what he described as phraseology, a mindless repetition of gospel truths lacking integrity and a connection to reality. This can be just as sleep-inducing. No wonder Bonhoeffer once criticized his audience at a conference for reading the Bible no longer against themselves, but only for themselves. It is another variation of what Kierkegaard called the yes of promise keeping. In line with Jesus' parable, Kierkegaard continues to insist that the only way to awaken from one's innocent slumber is to be more honest with oneself. The first son's bold defiance becomes exemplary. An honest no, Kierkegaard says, possesses much more promise. In other words, those who disagree with us might prove to show more integrity and insight than those who quickly consent. Did Jesus not trust those who were too quick to agree? 
Is this why he kept rebuking Peter when he was most confident and determined? In Jesus' view, Peter had not fully understood what would be expected of him. I wonder, what is it that makes it so hard to be more realistic and honest with oneself and to say no? Is it the fear of disappointing those who thought they can trust us and rely on us? Is it the fear of losing the respect and admiration of fellow believers and activists? Or is it rather the fear of not being true to one's own standards and ideals? Are we afraid to face our own mediocrity? Can we not bear the full truth of our own half-heartedness? Jesus makes it very clear with this parable. He prefers bold defiance to half-hearted approval. Outrage and disapproval seem to be more appropriate reactions to his preaching and teaching than a self-congratulatory approval. In fact, it seems that Jesus cannot stand a submissive, I, I sir, Remember in John's Gospel, he says that he no longer calls us servants, but friends. Jesus does not ask for blind obedience. Trust wants to be earned and always allows for freedom of thought and speech. And of course, the more radical the preaching and teaching, the more impassioned should be one's resistance. Honestly, when was the last time that you felt like saying to Jesus, no, thank you, I'm not going to do it. What you are suggesting and expecting is way too utopian and completely unrealistic. Instead, we are often rather quick to agree and rather pleased with ourselves. So, what would such a bold and honest no sound like? Let's take Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in the same Gospel of Matthew. What if working in the Father's vineyard is about going into the vineyard and doing exactly what Jesus teaches in the Sermon of the Mount? If that is the case, then I would like to add the following rebuke. To the first son's bold and honest no. Jesus, I have listened to your Sermon on the Mount, but how can you expect me to be angry, to be not angry with those who have insulted me? And how can you expect me to cut off my right hand that causes me to stumble? Why? Should I not seek revenge, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth? My opponents will laugh at me and call me a coward. How am I supposed to simply offer the other cheek to the one who has just slapped me? And how can I keep giving to the one who wants to borrow from me? Now do you really expect me to love my enemies? And how am I supposed to give in a way that the left hand does not know what the right hand is doing? And what do you mean that God cannot forgive my sins if I don't forgive others their sins? Yes, and how does one fast and not look somber? And what does it mean not to store up treasures for oneself? Do I not need to plan ahead and be financially wise? How can one not worry about money in a world ruled by mammon? Do you really expect me not to worry about my life, what I would eat and drink? Am I not a bird of the air? No, I'm also not a flower in the field. Our lives are more complex than theirs. And why should I get judged? when I judge others. 
dare you call me a hypocrite with a plank in the eye just because I criticize others? And how can there be nothing in between a narrow and a wide gate? Why do you have to be so extreme? And just because I'm not always able to put your words into practice does not mean that I have built my house on sand. Our parable makes it clear that Jesus would prefer such a rebellious no to an anxious and submissive yes. And the reason for it is beautifully captured again by Kierkegaard when he continues to argue. An honest no can stimulate Repentance may not be far away. He who says no becomes almost afraid of himself. What is that fear about that Kierkegaard mentions? What is it that one suddenly becomes aware and afraid of? Is it not the slow but growing realization that there is really no alternative to Jesus' radical vision. And the louder and stronger our resistance, the clearer it becomes to everyone around us. The deep inside, we know that Jesus got it right. And indeed, Remorse and repentance may then not be far away. Soon we will find ourselves to walk the talk, while the rest might still only talk the walk. The parable makes it clear Jesus does not look for perfection but for honesty. For such honesty holds the promise of repentance, of forgiveness, and of a life with integrity. This is the reason why going to work in God's vineyard and taking the Sermon on the Mount seriously begins with Jesus' blessing of those who acknowledge their poverty of spirit and allow themselves to mourn. For to admit one's inability and to grieve one's unwillingness is to open oneself to God's unconditional love. Such love is truly empowering and we cannot do without it. Rembrandt's painting of the prodigal son captures the beauty and mystery of such a return. But this reunion would not have been possible without an initial bold and painful no. Amen. As you leave from here, may the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and the rains fall soft upon the fields of your life. And may God hold you in the palm of her hand until 
we meet again. Amen.